This program is being provided by the 15 members of the Vancouver Educational Telecommunications Consortium, TV Etc. Hi everybody. I'm just going to wing it. I must be Cheryl Smith. Nothing too exciting, but if you do want to try to get a hold of me, I spell my first name with an S. And uh, middle initial is A. And you have to figure out how to spell Smith. I'm going to talk to you later. So um, I'm not going to try to use this mic because I think I can have a, I have a coach's voice. So if you can't hear me without this, then let me know. Otherwise, I feel like I have to karaoke or something. As you can tell, I have quite a little sense of humor. Uh, that's why I'm constantly entertained. My name is Cheryl Smith. I'm an intervention specialist and a uh, university professor. I've been working in the district for, for about 15 years. Um, I have a master's in clinical psych, specializing in trauma and addiction. I have uh, 27 years of being clean and sober. So. Um, between my experiential knowledge, my academic education, and I think professional experience, I think I'm pretty well versed to provide you with some information that I think that would be beneficial for you to know. So um, I believe in a little audience participation, so if there's any questions that you have at any time, please feel free to just ask, and I'll do my best to try to answer them. What I'm going to do is introduce you um, to, I not only have an hour, um, I'll probably go over, because I'm going to have a, a captured audience, uh, but what I have are, hopefully you will learn by the end of today, uh, the newer drugs that are available in this area, so you become more mindful. So it's a combination between drug and alcohol education and drug identification. So it's one thing to know of a drug, but how on earth do you know what it looks like? For some crazy reason, I don't know why they wouldn't let me drive with all those drugs in my car here to actually show you. So, <laughs> What I like to do in every presentation is that I wear, um, I like to hand out this bracelet. And I do my best as an adult in this world to model respect because all of us as adults are um, really role models 24-7, and I think it's important that we become more mindful about how we conduct ourselves, particularly with young people. So the bracelet says, humankind, respect others. And it's my way of remembering that every day when I wake up, it is my responsibility to empower another human being and to conduct myself in the most respectful way uh, possible. It doesn't matter what color, what race, what ethnicity. I mean, we all have such a rich diversity in our world, and yet we have such big misunderstandings. A lot of people are turning to substances simply because they're looking to self-soothe. They're self-medicating. And my intention is, hopefully if each one of us take responsibility about how we conduct ourselves in the world, then we get to make changes. And that includes around substance use. If you're an adult who uses, and you're trying to tell a young person not to use, you are, you, you are losing any credibility whatsoever. So it is important that if you're going to be promoting a healthier way of being in the world, I'm asking you to at least maybe look back at yourself, take an inventory of what you can do differently, and then join in this effort for a healthier way of living. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to hand these out. You're more than welcome to have put them on. You can save them. Give them to your children, the neighbor. You can put your name on the inside in case you forget your name at a certain age. I know that's happened to me. Thank you. Okay. So is there a way to turn the front light down? I think so. Or are we going to go completely dark? I think it's one of the Will I be able to see my computer? Okay. 
Can you see that well? All right. So what I want you to do, first of all, is imagine that we're living in a culture that is the most highly using than ever in history. We have the most largest population for adults and for young people um, who are self-soothing with illicit drugs, illegal drugs, and prescription medications and, legal, and other legal substances. So I want you to be aware of that if you turn the, your TV on between 5 and 8 o'clock at night, ask yourself how many commercials am I seeing on a daily basis that tells me that if I don't feel well, I take this. If something's not working, I take that. If I got cramps, I take that. Right? And if we're seeing it, how much of our own children and teens getting exposed to it? We call this the risk and protective uh, factors. And when we're telling young people to just be their own person, say no to drugs, come on, be stronger, what we're really talking about, what we're trying to do is teach moral development and character development. But it's really beneficial to understand all these rings of influence that contribute to our young people's decisions, including substance use. So let's say this is a little person little child that's born into the world, and they are immediately going to be influenced by what's going on in the home. It means extended family besides your family of origin which you're being born into. The family itself is not going to be influenced by what's in their community. If I'm living in a community that's impoverished or has a high risk of crime and substance use, that's going to have a direct impact on the family, which then is going to have a ripple effect into the developing young Team or child. On top of that, what kind of environment do you live in? You know, the environment could be uh, worldwide events as well that's impacting what's going on. Do we live in a toxic community? Meth being one of the highest methamphetamine, excuse me, Vancouver used to be one of the highest uh, methamphetamine labs in the U.S. But since there was a tremendous amount of uh, collaboration in the community, we were able to really shut down a great many of those labs. But I guarantee you that if you're dumping toxic chemicals into the environment, it certainly is going to have an impact on the family as well as um, the community and the individual. So these are the factors that I want you to take a look at. Like how much are we building in for resiliency? And how much are we subjecting our children that's going to make them want to self-soothe? Because remember, the brain, the brain does not stop growing till age 25. 25. So if a young person is putting a drug in their body, it's interfering with the growth plate as well as the synapses and the formations of the brain itself. So all of you who are parents, when you ask your teen or your child, my God, what were you thinking? And they kind of look at you like, ah, oh, it wasn't, really. <laughs> and, then the, and then they realize that they're supposed to tell you something, so then they say, oh my God, what am I supposed to tell them because that's what they want to hear. So then they work really fast and tell you all the things you want to hear. Not that anyone's ever had that experience. So this is a little uh, PSA, hopefully it'll... Is there a... Oh, there it is. Does this have connections to the speakers? Am I connected to the internet? No, to the speakers you should be connected. But no connection to the internet? Oh. Well, good thing I have a good sense of humor. We're going to move on to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what I want to do first of all is hop right in and let you know, if my teen is possibly using, what are some of the, the warning signs I should be looking at? So you're going to look under different categories. You have emotional changes which includes your moods, flare-ups, irritability. There's an attitude a lot of times that doesn't matter. You know? Your physical changes, you're going to see maybe a lack of interest. They used to be really interested in maybe sports, music, um, drama, their passion for dance. They might slowly lose an interest in that. Uh, energy, depending on the drug in which they're using, they can have low energy, and they can also have very high energy, depending on what it is. I love it when I go in and talk to a teen that's been busted with possession or under the influence, and their eyes are so bloody, and, then, and they have a closed door, and I open it, and you just go, bam! 
You didn't try to tell these guys that you weren't high, right? I mean, seriously. Because the room has a puff to it. And their eyes are usually, the eyes are an amazing story. When you get to know drugs, the pupil of the eye, when you're under the influence of drug, is either going to constrict or dilate. So it's going to go small or large, depending on the drug in which the, the person may be using. And of course, depending on the drug itself, you're going to um, have a lack of coordination or slurred speech. Memory lapses, poor concentration, especially if they're using pot, short-term memory loss. You know, they'll tell you a story, then also they can't remember what that was, so they'll tell you again. I love that one. I said, listen, if you're going to lie to your parent, you shouldn't be under the influence because it's really bad enough when you create the lie, but then you don't even remember the lie which you told them. You ever had that happen? <laughs> Behavioral changes. Now, uh, excuse me, uh, this is like the school sitting situation. You might see some changes in their attendance, their grades, their overall academic performance. Uh, they might be rebelling against family rules, but that's difficult in the teen years because developmentally, that's their task, is to try to individuate. So uh, please don't think because your teen is rebelling that all of a sudden, <laughs> under these mood or mind altering substances, I know what you're using. Okay. Uh, switch. A lot of times they'll have a, a different peer group because if all of a sudden they start using, it's amazing. They're kind of like magnets. When people start kicking it together and they're using, they seem to find each other in this very invisible way. And you'll start seeing a change in the peer. And sometimes you'll notice there'll be a change in their um, physical hygiene or the way in which they appear. But what I want to do say to you you can be highly functional and still be addicted to a drug. And I think that's the um, challenge for many people to believe. I know this because I was one. I, I didn't even know that I became physically addicted to a drug. I had a full ride athletic scholarship at the University of Washington. I had authors to play professionally. I was using in secrecy great grades. I overperformed. I got great grades, did wonderfully athletically, and as I was doing that, the reason I was doing it were the family secrets. I had a great deal of sexual violations and abuse in my own home, and I didn't know how to cope with it. And when I ended up choosing to share with my parents, they wouldn't believe me and kicked my twin sister and I out of the home. And so from that point on, when someone introduced me to drugs, uh, I ran with them. And it was such a humiliating, shameful experience that when I started overcompensating, I even started performing better to hide the secret. But every time I came off the high, it brought me to a lower state. And I ended up uh, having two failed suicide attempts before I was able to uh, reach out and have someone help me. So part of my mission is to work with teens to let them know that um, I have a story that I can hopefully share with them so they don't go down the same path to normalize what goes on for teens um, and for anyone who uses. People ask why do people in use, why, what motivates teens to start using or engage in drug use? There's two, as a mental health therapist, there are two needs that have to be met your whole life. The need for a sense of belonging and to be loved valued and have purpose okay everyone needs those well when you're a teenager and you're just now coming into this part of you developing himself the need to be fitting in is huge so they want to escape they want to relax they want to children and youth are so incredibly bored but the reason they're also bored is because they were raised in a generation my friends that have overstimulated their brains. They are constantly on the go, hypervigilant. Hand and eye coordinations, if you measure them, they're off the scale. But their social skills, their ability to articulate their feelings are behind. They're full of emotion, yay, because why? That's the biggest part of the brain that's active right now. So all of a sudden they're thrown with this emotion, they don't have the cognitive ability to figure it all out. 
They don't know how to identify the feeling. And so that's why you see teens that are really histrionic and very dramatic. You say, oh my gosh, isn't that a little overboard? But that's what's going on internally for them. They want to rebel. They also want to be a grown up. They see all these other celebrations. We don't have any ritual, uh, I would say, rites of passage in the American culture unless you're belonging to a specific culture or a religious affiliation um, or ethnicity. But the rites of passage in our culture, what happens when you're 21? Right. And then on top of that is what happens every time we do have a celebration around the holidays. What are we marketing? Celebration of life. We can't celebrate life without self-soothing. You see? So on one hand we're saying, look, don't use, don't drink, don't drug, and yet we're mauling the complete opposite of that. So these are some of the newer drugs I want to introduce you to, and I'll have a some PowerPoints to show you what they look like. Cheese, you ever heard of it? It's called black tar heroin and Tylenol PM. MAC-22, heroin and fentanyl. Fentanyl is extremely dangerous. It's about 10 to 20 times stronger than morphine. In fact, um, do you remember a while back when there were these number of heroin deaths, it was in New York, where there are Hundreds of, they thought there were street people getting black tar heroin. Well, what it was was actually MAC-22. It was heroin being mixed with fentanyl, and so they were overdosing off of it. Sex deceived. This is the newer one as well. If that doesn't get you, you have ecstasy and Viagra. <laughs> now, I don't know what you know about ecstasy, but we'll be covering that in club drugs. Ecstasy is a love drug. It's a stimulant and a hallucinogen. So if I'm under the influence of uh, E, I love myself, really. So I love touch. And I'm amped out, my body's hot. I have no boundaries. I love you and you and you. And then all of a sudden I'm so high that when I come off of it, I, I crash extremely hard, like two days afterwards. <coughs> Strawberry quick. Nestle's quick mix, that's strawberry with methamphetamine. Yaba, distributed mostly to middle school and underage elementary kids. It looks just like Skittles. Mm -hmm. It comes in grape, strawberry, lime, cherry, um, lemon, and they are the shape. I tell kids, you're not giving me a Skittle till I see you open up that pack. I'll show you images of what that looks like as well. Yeah, I'll, I can hand that. I can get one for you. Absolutely. Yava is also the strongest form of methamphetamine. Salvia diffenorum. Have you heard of this? Salvia is not actually a drug. Currently, you can go to a smoke shop, order it online, it's an herb. And it's a very strong hallucinogen that looks like pot, if you're not familiar with what it looks like. There's a flower called That's what it is, it's part of that plant. It's out of the northern Mexican mountains. You can buy it from the gardens. Yes, but there's a certain part of the plant that you... Do I have to talk to you after class about your little self? How do you know so much about this plant? <laughs> Just these. Yeah. Okay. These are the things that make me um, extremely upset, particularly because I know these drugs are being marketed to um, children and marijuana to children that are in uh, middle school and grade school. Chronic candy. Chronic candy is all different forms of candy that's being made, and it tastes like pot, but it doesn't have the potency of the THC that actually gives you the hot. So all this candy is being made, and why do you think that's being made? So they get really introduced to the idea of what it tastes like, so when pot is then uh, cannabis, marijuana is handed to them later, 
they will automatically start making this easier transition into the taste of it, the smell of it. BZT, DMT, again these are synthetic amphetamines and uh, DMT is a hallucinogen. It's also in its natural state, comes from uh, plant, seed, bark. Um, synthetically manufactured as well. DXM, main ingredient, you know that's in cough syrup. So be aware that just because kids may not be accessing other drugs, they can be going right into your medicine cabinet. Okay? They can be going right in there and just drinking those cough syrups like crazy to just to get the buzz, the, the warmth of it. Cat is another flowering type of evergreen shrub. Um, it's got two different types of stimulants that are involved in it. And it costs somewhere around 50 to, $15 to $50 a bundle, which is anywhere from 20 to 40 stems. 2CE is a synthetic psychedelic drug. Have you heard any of these? No. Yeah. These are things that are just coming in more and more into the Clark County, into Vancouver. And these are the things that are also readily available to our youth and teens and children. Uh, with 2CE, uh, you have a tremendous amount of complaints from children or youth that will start talking like they have TMG, TMJ, excuse me, their uh, mouths were hurt. They'll have um, a tremendous amount of tension in the jaw. There's a sentence heights of paran uh, they're paranoid, they're fearful, because it's a hallucinogen. I wanted to jump into prescription medications right away because prescription medication is the number one drug of choice right now among our youth. It's equally as um, desired as marijuana. Unfortunately, uh, this has a huge risk of a lot more deaths and a lot more seizures and other physical complications. Every day, every day, 2,500 teenagers will use a drug, a prescription a prescription drug for the very first time. I'd like to show you this, but we are connected. So people say, well, how can that happen? How is it that people end up using it? Because if you have this desire uh, to get high, it will always overrun the perception of risk. So that's why kids will say, well, you know, I've already tried this. It's pretty good. There's no risk. So the information they get minimizes the potential harm. So they just go off each other's uh, narrative, their own experience. And what I try to teach young people is that our brains are completely different. If everyone in this room started using the exact same drug at the exact same time, we would get to addiction at a different rate and how those drugs would interact in our brain would be different as well. So your 12 to 17 year olds, um, if you look at the amount of prescription drug abuse, it's, that combination is more than if you take ecstasy, crack cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine combined. So they're using more prescriptions compared to these in a combination. 60% of teens who have abused prescription painkillers did so before age 15. <clears throat> you need to know the average age of onset of drug use and smoking is anywhere between 10 and 11. So by the time those young people come into a high school, we're not doing prevention, we're doing predominantly intervention. And this is why I really want to advocate for every school district to have prevention specialists within elementary and middle school because our education for teens and children must start earlier. That's why it's very difficult because I have many adults saying, well, my child, not my child syndrome, because we keep thinking the onset of drug use starts in high school, when it really it doesn't. So there are just as many new prescription drug users, uh, 12 to 17, as there are uh, marijuana users. So where are they getting them? Guess where? In your homes. So I always encourage people, please take an inventory of the substances, and you know, not my son, not my daughter, well, not their friends, believe me, they take them. And then what happens is that they come to the school and they share them, 
They go into the bathroom, they cut them up, they snort them. They pop them at lunch, they put them in their drinks in the morning. So you need to be aware that, and also, remember I mentioned about modeling? Here's a great example. There were two students in one of our schools. One of the girls brought um, a pain medication to school because she had a bad back. It wasn't initially prescribed for her, but it was in the house. Her mother had the prescription initially written for her, and the uncle called and said, I threw my back out. Can I take a couple of those Percocet that you had? And the mom said, sure, no problem. You're my brother. So what did the mom model? Exactly. It is okay to share the pills. So the young girl comes to school and realizes that her friend's not doing well. She aches, so she gives this Percocet to another student. Really out of quite being innocent about it. I mean, these are really some great kids, but just a horrible incident, being naive and ignorant by watching what happened at home as well. So I don't think substance use at all is a laughing matter. There's no such thing as a safe drug anymore. Um, even medical marijuana is a controversial subject, but it's not one I'm going to promote. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. So the potential for, uh, for prescription drug abuse science is that it's really important to pay attention to every part of your son or your daughter or the young person you're, that's sitting before you because it's a combination of how they present. So again, look at the, uh, their eyes, are they these little tiny dots? Um, are they having stomach complaints? Do they feel nauseous? Do they say they feel flu-like? Uh, are there respiratory uh, difficulties? Um, are they anxious? Are there mood swings? Obviously, if they're delusional, and delusions, let me explain. I don't know what you know. So I don't want to patronize you. So does everyone know the difference between a hallucination and a delusion? Would you like to know? Yes. I'm not to tell you. <laughs> what it is, very easy to remember. Hallucinations affect all your five senses. So what are those? You don't want to? <laughs> and you know what's so great about that? Then any drug that you say, that you hear is a hallucinogen, you know that that drug is going to affect one of those or more of those senses. So that's why when you see people talking to their imaginary friends, now Bluetooth is a bad thing. Because <laughs> in my car, it's in the speaker system, so I'm driving down the road and I'm, I'm like, do they think I'm psychotic? <laughs> just talking away. But you want to take a look at, okay, what's the color of their skin? Are they flushed? Are they sweating? Do they complain of what we call tachycardia, where the heart goes really, really fast, like heart palpitations? Uh, are there some slurred speech, dizziness? Which is really interesting because when you're used to seeing someone on uh, particularly like Vicodin and other pain medications, they're, they're slower in their speech because they don't realize that the regulation of how quickly they deliver it is much slower. Oh, delusions, right. See? Yeah, listen, right here. <laughs> this is why you do not want to do drugs, okay? I am a walking example. No, no, Must be that? No. Okay, delusions are real life possibilities that aren't true. An erotic delusion would be, for example, just based on a true story, uh, I was a therapist in training uh, in Barron. I wasn't supposed to have psychotic clients. And the presenting problem was there was a woman who was not getting enough quality time with her boyfriend. Seems reasonable. She comes in and I was like, okay, where did you meet? She said a book signing. And that he was also a DJ. And I do know that this in California sort of was. He was definitely a DJ. And she was talking about all the things that they used to do, aren't doing anymore. I said, you know, this sounds like it would be better if we indeed had some couples counseling so I can get a better perspective on what's going on for him. So um, I got the phone number, and I call this man. He's a DJ, all right, but he has no clue who this woman is. That was what we call the 
uh, erotic delusion. So real life possibilities. When you start tweaking on meth uh, excuse me, methamphetamines, stimulants, other types of drugs, and that paranoia kicks in, they'll create a story that's not true. Example, someone's following me. I know you're cheating on me. I know you're lying to me. And they really do believe it. Thank you for bringing me back to that. But, but we also wanted that some of those symptoms are menopause. <laughs> <laughs> menopause, yes. <laughs> yeah, but, and that's another reason why I did not remember my delusions, I'm sure. <laughs> But I like when somebody gives me extra ammunition I can use. <laughs> so um, the good news is that there are definitely you can, uh, steps you can take. The greatest thing about getting a body of knowledge, see my, my intent here is to give you a wider angled lens in which to view what you can do to empower you. So you need to monitor, secure your cabinets, secure your meds, and then dispose of anything that's not really being used, that's old. Because the one thing that happens are what's called farm parties. Are you familiar with farm parties? Okay. Farm parties are simply parties that where people come together, teens come together, and they grab whatever prescription medications they can get. They come to a centralized location, they dump all the pills in a bowl, and they randomly grab whatever they want. Tell me what the risk is there. Okay. Any questions? How do you dispose of the medicines you're not using anymore? That's a really good question. I, what I've done is I've gone back to my doctor. Um, because you don't want to put them down the toilet anymore because they go into our water system. So that's probably why we're a little loopy. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to blame it on the water. <laughs> so yeah, don't put them down the toilets. Uh, people want to just crush them up. I still would say, I, I try to dispose of them by just going back to the doctor and say, would you mind getting rid of these? Uh, does anyone have any other ideas that they've done? Take them to the police station? In some places, but not Walgreens, uh, but where my sister lived in Chicago, her drugstore would take them back. Oh. So you might want to call the uh, drugstore that's closest to you as well. well Walgreens see. does. Walgreens one? No, and I don't know about the others, but I know Walgreens does it because I have some. Well, what I wanted to know is, would you like to know about club drugs? I have to decide which drugs to cover for you in such a short period of time. Club drugs, club drugs are the, probably the, the most frequently used drugs that are on campuses in Clark County, and they're usually at parties or raves. What about younger kids? Can you cover the kids? Yes, they have access to them as well. Uh, raves, it's really interesting. This is where it's important to get uh, educated parents because there was a young female 10th grader who told her mother that she was going to a rave and she told her mother a rave was a dance party at school. And a rave is a very large, what I call, covert party where most of that information is being shared on the internet and is usually held very late at night in a warehouse or at a park and they run from early, uh, I'd say probably about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, all the way through into the morning hours. And sometimes, depending on the location, they'll go for a couple days. And this is where you're gonna find uh, all the different types of club drugs, which I will go over. Can I ask a question? Is the club drug one also that you can put your drinks? Yes, GHB is one of the club drugs, GHB, which I'll cover. It's uh, odorless and clearless. It's the new rape drug, newer rape drug. How long has that been out? Uh, it's been out probably, I would say it's taken off really more within the probably the past five years. But I'm seeing it more now than ever before. And the danger in this is that quite, I'll, I'll cover that in a little bit. Let me just pull this up real quick. I want you to think about drugs as this. Uppers, downers, 
and all around your school. Because drugs are either going to elevate you up, your entire central nervous system, your respiratory system, everything in your body is going to go high, or you're going to drop low. Those are going to be your depressants, and then you have a combination of different drugs like your hallucinogens, um, opiates that can give you maybe a little different experience. Um, cannabis is a category in and of itself. So let me go over a little ecstasy right now. Okay, so ecstasy, like I mentioned earlier, is the love drug. Um, what you want to also know about drugs in general, I like to pull this up, is that every drug that the government is aware of puts it under a schedule one through five. And based on the risk and the potential for um, addiction or medicinal um, possibilities, they'll put it under that schedule. It comes in every form. It can come in powder, tablet, pill. Uh, it can be put in different types of drinks. It can be put in a pot. It can be put anywhere. You can cook it. You can roll it up and put it in something and cook it. So your route of administration, uh, that simply means clinically, how do you get it in the body? So your route of administration, obviously, you can smoke it, inject it, um, take it orally, inject it, I mean, intravenously. So any way you can manage it. Uh, the costs are, depending on where you are in the United States, it costs 20 to $30 for a dose. Uh, but teens and children are incredibly resourceful. They barter. They will take their iPods, their phones, their clothing. They'll do um, sexual favors. They'll do everything they can to exchange something they have in order to get the drug. Now, we know that there's been dealers in this area could also get teens to say, if you recruit more teens to use this, I'll give you this many more for free. So now we have the benefit of the supply and demand that they also have access to. It is illegal to manufacture, possess, or sell in the United States. It is a Schedule One drug. Get audio and visual hallucinations. I'm going to try to get through here so I can see the drugs. So, what does it do physically? It increases everything in your body from your heart rate, blood pressure, you can get nauseous, loss of appetite, obviously, because that's a stimulant. A lot of times you're going to see a jaw tightness and uh, teeth cleansing. When you go to raves and these parties where uh, ecstasy is, they will have pacifiers. <coughs> they will have uh, masks where they put um, methylatum on the inside because it, it hides that sense, uh, the sensations, right? They'll sometimes hold on to big um, balls or balloons. Mm -hmm. So when the music's vibrating, they get it right off there so that heightened sense of touch. But many times over, you're going to find dentists are becoming more and more aware of not only meth users but ecstasy users because you're going to get a decay of the teeth, and you're gonna see a lot more problems with the jaw. And a lot of times when people even stop using ecstasy, they have a speech impediment, and they'll have a lisping sound to their uh, speech. So again, uh, when they burn out, they burn and they crash hard. So you might wonder, they'll say, you know, you'll say to your son or your daughter, I don't quite understand why you're sleeping so much. You didn't used to sleep this much. If you're crashing for the next just a couple days. And in that last the second day is usually when you're going to see the most profound effect of them. There's a lot more agitation. Um, and, and many times over, there's um, blackouts. So sometimes they won't even remember some of the things that occurred the night before. So I'm going to show you just some images of what they look like. The way that you make, um, it's made in a lab, made out of a variety of different chemicals that's illicit. 
the reason this drug is so um, confusing to teens and also adults who use it because it's not just teens using, it's a white collar uh, as well as blue collar drug. Does not discriminate based on it. It's very easy to obtain. When you make ecstasy, it's made in a lab and they use what's called uh, press tools or a machine. Press tools are simply a stamp. So as you can see, this one here in front of you was stamped with blue. It's the Obama. And the colors, when let's say someone handed me my first time I took ecstasy, I took a green Obama. And let's say I survived it, I kind of liked it. I didn't like how I felt after, but you know, I was okay, I survived it. But let's say a couple weeks later, someone gives me the same drug, a green Obama. I, out of ignorance, will say, oh, it's the same drug. No, you have no idea who made that. You don't know what chemicals are in there. The only thing that they did was they used similar food coloring and they used the same press tool. So they're not necessarily the same drug, particularly it came from somebody else. I don't know how well you can see these uh, in prints. Okay, so Nike is a logo up here. I got a Mickey Mouse. You come in all different types of marketing campaigns, logos, colors, shapes. As they become more and more reshaped, what you're going to end up seeing here is that some of them are going to start looking like vitamins, some of them are going to look like aspirin. Over. These capsules are extremely dangerous because when drugs are put in a capsule, very easy to add others. So when people get these, they believe it's just straight E, when really, on some of these, I know you can't see it. This has methamphetamine in it as well as caffeine. You have caffeine and meth and MDA here. So depending on who's put it together, usually ecstasy is not just the chemicals. You've got other drugs that are thrown in as well, including baby laxatives and baking soda. Again, just a variety of different logos, the press tools, Volkswagen, anywhere from Mercedes, Nike, they even have one for Buddha. Mm -hmm. So who's this marketed to? MTV, smiley face, and the little bunny. Who's this for? Oh. Elementary. <coughs> so if someone had gave me these during Valentine's Day, would I know that's ecstasy? No. And these are the dangers that that's how they're marketing. This here looks like a vitamin, the children's bears. Right, looks like a lifesaver. So you're seeing why it's so easy. The Spencers are using now are Pez containers. So when you see kids walking around with Pez, they're not necessarily candy. It could be E as a, I'm just masking it. Mr. Potato Head will never be the same to me. I used to have a Mr. Potato Head child. Now these are just going to be some hiding. This is an example of one of the buzz that was down. 4,000 um, ecstasy pills were actually wrapped in that particular diaper. So what happens when you're on E, the brain, the brain, this sounds so silly when I say it, but the brain is kind of stupid. <laughs> it really is. The brain actually gets so fooled because most drugs mimic the natural chemicals that are inside your brain. So you have serotonin, dopamine, neuroepinephrine. And so when the drug is made outside of itself and it's put in, it just thinks, oh my gosh, you're giving me more dopamine, or you're giving me more serotonin, or you're giving me whatever. So that's why it doesn't recognize its own potential increase in addiction. I'm running out of time. Are we doing okay? Eight minutes. Oh my God. <laughs> this isn't going to work. All right. Can you see this image? This is basically what I want to show you. 
Baby Rattler, you have the images here with the, the balloon. Okay, I have to show you. I'll show you JHB. I just talked about it. Looks just like this. Looks like this. It's odorless, it's tasteless, and it's clearless. GHB. What does it stand for? I'll gonna get there right now. What does it stand for? I heard you. I wish I could remember right this second and I can't. Honestly. It is a drug that completely um, sits there and attacks your central nervous system and part of the brain where you cannot remember. Or it's, it paralyzes part of the central nervous system to where even if you come into your waking state, you may not be fully conscious. And um, it can have temporary paralysis. There were two young women in one of our schools who had gone to one of those local um, AMPM gas stations and asked the adult male to please uh, buy them some alcohol. And so they went over to the local park with this man and they started drinking the alcohol. And at one point, two of them had, one of them had to use the bathroom. So they thought, okay, let's be safe. So they left their alcohol, went off together to use the bathroom, came back, finished drinking. Next thing they know, memory-wise, is that one of them woke up to look over to see her best friend being raped. She couldn't get up. Remember, she's passing in and out of consciousness. At one point, she wakes in her, her waking state, and she is being raped. And the courage these two young women had, because even after that, they came and they reported what had happened. And we were able to go to the store in which this occurred, look at the video, <coughs> and we were able to apprehend the offender. This also happens, by the way, where on low doses, it feels like you're under the influence of alcohol. It's kind of like this lightheaded feeling. That's on small percentages of it. So uh, many times, students think it's funny if they put this small amount into the kids' drinks. So I always tell young people, if you're ever anywhere and you put your drink down and you walk away, do go back to it. Because you just never know. It also can be in a liquid form. There was a student who bummed a cigarette on the way to school one day, and by the time they got to school, they were hallucinating so severely, and they were losing their consciousness. They couldn't understand what was happening. They ended up being taken to the hospital. Come to find out, the um, cigarette had been dipped in uh, liquid GHB as well as another hallucinogen. So many, many drugs are getting tainted. Um, let me ask you some questions first, because I know we're running out of time. Did I give you too much information in a short period of time? Okay. Any questions? <coughs> What's the most widely used drug right the, now? The most widely used drugs right now are alcohol, prescription medications, and pot and tobacco. But tobacco in Washington State is one of the lowest. We made an amazing uh, decline in teen use because we really worked at addressing the issue. But prescription medication is the number one. But I need to tell you what that goes with that is heroin use. It is cheaper. What happens is that you will start using uh, an opiate, a prescription medication, and all of a sudden you become physically addicted to it. And it costs more to buy prescription medications than it is to buy heroin off the street. So you're getting kids that used to use prescription medication now who are now starting to use heroin. They don't immediately start interject, uh, injecting it. What they usually do is either smoke it or snort it up their nose. So we have a bigger population now who's becoming more and more addicted to heroin besides prescription meds. So we're um, 
unfortunately increasing the major problem in our own youth. Yes. Gentlemen, I have a question, and I'm not I believe you're probably talking about the electronics are probably the um, drugs that are at the raves. I believe that's probably what he's referring to. That's all I can. Is that a lot of music? I could believe that. I mean, uh, sure. Uh, Our brains are so susceptible. Um, or to, I take a combination of music and throw in another type of drug with it, and it's really heightened what's going on in that brain. The one thing I did want to mention with ecstasy, I need to hop back to this for a second, is that uh, the reason you can also drown yourself with ecstasy and drinking too much water because your body temperature increases so severely it can overheat and what um, kids do is they're gonna, or adults, we're gonna want to quench that thirst. Now, can you imagine that you're taking water, you can drown your system, but now let's think about this for a minute. Ecstasy is a stimulant and a hallucinogen. Let's say you don't take water, but you throw in alcohol. Now you have a depressant thrown in. So now you have three different drugs all in the same body, and the increase of seizure and the possibility of death increase. So kids will either seize or have complications because one, they took too much of the same drug, or two, they took too much of a combination of drugs. And that increased your risks. Okay. Sure, I have a question. I'm wondering if parents or guardians will see some signs that you talked about. And I think it might be pretty scary, like not knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. Do you have a couple Yes, good question. Yes. One of the most important things I can try to do as an intervention, I'm hired by all the hospitals and, and many hospitals in, in Oregon, that's where I live, to go in and do interventions like when you see on HBO. The most important thing I want you to know is that if you're going to confront someone about their substance use or your suspicions, what you really need to do is take a deep breath and do not come at, at them to attack their character. You want to be very succinct about what are the behaviors in which you are seeing. I'm concerned because these are the changes that I've seen. And then you start naming what you're seeing. Or you can say, you know, at one point, what we had was a very intimate and close relationship. We used to do this together, this together, but now I find yourself isolating from me, and I miss you, and I can't help but wonder what's going on. So you see the difference as opposed to saying you're a loser, you, if you're drugging, you're drinking, you're a loser. Um, it's my way or the highway, if you bring drugs into this house, you're gone. When you talk this way to children and teens, they really believe it's the ultimatum. So where are you supposed to talk to them then? I mean, how are they supposed to approach you? Where's the door of possibility in which they can maybe come to you? If you've been saying no drugs, by God. You don't want to say you're promoting them, but if I find out my son or daughter are using, the way you want to do is sit down and say, you know, I, I, I've been told or I strongly suspect that you're possibly using, and well, before you answer it, I just want you to know that most important is in my relationship to you, and I really would like to know more about if it's true what the experience is like for you, what's, what's there for you, what's drawing you into it. Because I want my relationship with you, and there are times that your behaviors may may not like, but I love you, and I want to be a part of your life. Does this make sense? So I'm not saying it's okay, 
but I'm certainly trying to find a way to reach them. Yes. Now, the prescription drugs, uh, is that, would that be a treatment? I mean, because I confronted my daughter on the outside Now, is the treatment the same like as a regular street drug treatment? It, well, there's depends. Most of the, I personally believe that most of the time there's a mental health issue with a substance use issue, depending, unless of course it's an early onset where you caught them earlier. Um, there's usually the stages of treatment where you can try to get them to go to a 12 step meeting that's free in the community. And if they can get enough support around them and education, they might be able to stop on their own. The next is they go to an outside. Um, outside it's outpatient treatment where they'll go so many days a week at a, a certain treatment facility they still have their life during the day but in the afternoon or evening they might have specific hours so many days a week and they build in a different support get more education least restrictive is residential and residential treatment centers specialize in all different it depends on the treatment center they might just specialize in opiates, or they might specialize in co-occurring disorders where you have a mental health issue. At the same time, you have a drug addiction. Co-occurring disorders and dual diagnosis, they kind of get interchanged. When really they say, well, we're a dual diagnosed facility, you have to get really clear. I mean, clinically, to me, a dual diagnosis is like, I might be what's called polysubstance dependent. Like I have, I'm using more than one. I might be addicted to tobacco, alcohol, and a prescription drug, or maybe pot. So if I'm addicted to three or more, that's polysubstance. Okay. So it's important to find out, uh, that's why it is important first to get a UA, a urine analysis, to find out what is in their body because I had a team, three teams, who came to me who had been using Best of Friends, and they'd been smoking pot, and they had heard me talk about the idea that it could be other things are in it. So they went and had a UA, a urine analysis done. They were terrified to find out that the pot they had been smoking for so long had heroin in it. So it is important to find out what actually is in their body, no matter what they might think they're taking. The other is to find out um, have what's called an assessment, the, uh, an evaluation to determine where they might be on their line of use, you know? Because there is a way to determine that clinically. Are you swabbing the inside of the mouth now? There are different types of tests. You can do hair follicle, you can do the inside of the mouth, you can do the UA, you can do blood. Now methamphetamine, for example, leaves the body very quickly, so it's all about timing. You know, so it's, it doesn't attach itself to like the fat cells in your body. It really, or it really attacks more into the area that we flush it out. Okay. Uh, methamphetamine is a monster, and it's a monster because when you use, is that, I don't have a chalkboard. Do I have a chalkboard? No. Okay. We're gonna do this. Here's my mood. See my line? Okay. When I take methamphetamine my serotonin and dopamine go up here, okay? And they're in a high for 10 to 12 hours. I am so jacked that I can do anything. I'm superwoman, and I'm, I'm amped, I'm ready to go. But when I come down, here's my line, when I come down off of it, I don't stop here. My mood now is lower, because here's my serotonin and dopamine. So if I feel horrible now, what I'm gonna do is probably get another hit. I'm gonna look somewhere else. So I'll take another hit, now I'm going up again for 12 to 24. And then when I come down, I'm not staying here, I'm here. So now I'm dropping here. Do you see where the mood is going? And then at one point, when you stop drugging, uh, the most, uh, the longest meth uh, but I mean, um, addict I've ever worked with had been up for two weeks straight on meth run. And usually when you stop, here's your mood initially, when you stop drugging, over a period of time, your serotonin and dopamine really try to repair itself and get back up here. But when you use methamphetamine right now, it's a permanent loss. So the only way you get here is if you have to get an antidepressant. They're working with the pharmaceutical companies trying to find some other alternative. But that's what you're gonna need to get up here. That's why someone who is very loving and kind and generous, sweet, in a very, very short period of time, become angry, clipped, hostile, angry, and violent. This is where domestic violence and child abuse cases have increased so dramatically. 
Meth came from Asia to Hawaii first, didn't come to the mainland. I was in Hawaii when it first hit. Uh, the reason it's got a street name by the name of Crank, because in the 70s when it came out, it was actually being transported in the motorcycle um, uh, crank cases. So that's kind of where the street name came from. There's a form that's called ice, and it looks just like ice crystals. And that is the strongest form of methamphetamine. Okay. So this is why the drug is pretty wicked. And if teens are using methamphetamine, and believe me, they still are, um, <coughs> when you give a teen an antidepressant, sometimes they respond very well for a short period of time, long time, and all of a sudden, they can switch, and they become more aggressive, or they become more suicidal. So this is the risk that we're facing when we're trying to find a way to empower some solutions for our teens. With that being said, I think I've saturated you with as much info as possible in such a short period of time. If you do have a loved one that you're worried about, that you really believe um, you've done everything that you know how, I recommend probably uh, consulting with uh, someone who specializes in addictions or um, at least with an intervention specialist. When families try to confront without having any guidance, think of it this way, you only get one really great shot on confronting someone. And so I would rather have you be guided as to how to do that than to try to just do it at random. Take anything you like up here. It's free except not the trifles. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. This program is being provided by the 15 members of the Vancouver Educational Telecommunications Consortium, TV Etc.